Welcome to Tomorrow Never Knows with me, Bob Wilson, and Sir Warren Brown of the Beatles Kingdom. Today, our esteemed guest is author, Professor Joseph McBride. Joe is a regular wonder boy, is an expert on film, a groundbreaking investigator of the JFK assassination and other such crimes, and a writer of his very own and very moving memoir, one of my favorite books that I've ever read, which actually brought me to tears the only time when I ever read a book and had that happen. Welcome, Joseph. Hey, Bob. Great to see you again. And Warren, it's really always good to be with you, too. And well, welcome, before, Joe. Before we jump too deeply in, I have to remember our sponsor. Beatles Magazine is a publication with 370 plus million visitors in all their pages, read by thousands of fans around the world every day. Beatles News is updated daily, 24 hours, audio, video, photos, interviews, contests, additional materials, and more. So follow Beatles Magazine, the most complete online coverage, 24 hours a day. And how many days a week, Warren? Eight days a week. So it's good to have you two guys here and uh, a guest who's always interesting and he always makes us think and he always brings up many topics other people will not so easily discuss. Uh, Professor, you have an interesting history regarding JFK. This wasn't just something you picked up at a, at a point, you know, later in our lives. Uh, you were at it since you were sort of a youngster. Uh, can you expound on that for us a bit, please? Yeah, my uh, parents were both journalists in Milwaukee. Uh, my dad, Ray McBride, worked for the Milwaukee Journal for 41 years. My mother, Marion McBride, was um, a reporter for the Journal and then later the Milwaukee Sentinel. And she was also the vice chairman of the Democratic Party in Wisconsin. And she was active in the Democratic Party in 1960 when Kennedy was running against Hubert Humphrey for the nomination. She became the vice chairman the, the year after that, but she got me involved in the Kennedy campaign. She was early uh, in supporting JFK, uh, even though Humphrey was the favorite son because he was our, we called him our third senator. We had two Republican senators and he was the guy that the liberals went to for help because he's from Minnesota. And people thought he had the edge in Wisconsin, but my mother and Pat Lucy, the chairman of the Wisconsin party went for Kennedy and. Kennedy told Pat and Lucy after the election, he said, I couldn't have won the election without you in Wisconsin. And so it was a very crucial campaign. Uh, this was not, primaries were not a common thing at the time. They, the candidates were picked more by smoke filled rooms of the party bosses, the mayors, and the governors behind the scenes. And Kennedy was young, he was 43, and he wanted to kind of jump the uh, parade and get in there and he thought he would go directly to the people which was innovative and but he said he couldn't have won without wisconsin he was very frank he said that even before the voting um and so he um made a he spent months in wisconsin campaigning and he won against humphrey but it was um uh i thought at the time well great he won but it was he was disappointed because he won six out of 10 congressional districts. He won the um, the more urban liberal districts, which had more Catholic voters. And the religious issue had bec was still an issue in that campaign. And he lost the rural districts, so he didn't feel it was um, conclusive. He had to prove to the establishment that he could win in rural and Protestant areas. And so he had to go on to Wisconsin, to, uh, sorry, West Virginia, which was a very heavily Protestant state to prove that he could uh, have a crossover appeal, which he did. And, uh, but anyway, I was a volunteer in the Wisconsin primary campaign, which meant that I went door to door and distributed copies of a Reader's Digest uh, handout written by John Hersey 
from the New Yorker in 1944 about his PT-109 heroics in World War II, which were somewhat overblown. Uh, it turned out Joe Kennedy paid John Hersey to write that article. And, uh, <clears throat> but it was important to Kennedy's campaign that he'd, he'd be seen as a young war hero of World War II. And so I was promoting the Kennedy myth in a sense. And um, I got to meet him three times, twice when he was candidate, a candidate and once when he was president. Um, I went to a little rally <clears throat> my mother held in our hometown of Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, which is a suburb of Milwaukee. And it was called Kids for Kennedy. And she set it up over a noon hour and it was mothers and kids. There's only about a hundred people in, a, in the city hall. And I got to meet him, it was very casual. He walked in with uh, just a couple of aides and a photographer and he mingled with us and schmoozed and I got to talk to him a bit about profiles and courage. It was really memorable. And uh, a high point of my life was when uh, I just read profiles and courage and uh, he asked a question about it and I put my hand up. I was just ahead of a friend of mine putting his hand up and I answered the question and Kennedy said, uh, I hope I don't have to run against you in 1964, which was very nice to hear. He may have said that to other people, but um, he was, uh, he also said only in Wisconsin. And then I met him at a uh, April 3rd rally. That was the big rally in the film Primary, which people may have seen. It was just on TCM. It's a great documentary about the campaign. And the big rally in Milwaukee two days before the election, <clears throat> there were 3,000 people in a big hall and um, he gave a very stirring speech and uh, it was a huge crowd and it was very exciting. And that, to me, that's the moment when American politics turned into show business because four days before I had seen him in a small room and uh, there was not that kind of excitement, but four days later he was a rock star. I mean, it was just like uh, the Rolling Stones coming to a concert later and um, you could see the energy and, and the spectacle and that's portrayed in the film. And uh, that, that has had good and bad effects as we've seen in our politics since then. But uh, Kennedy understood the, the new media of, uh, you know, television especially, and um, used it very well, but he was intelligent and he, you know, he held <clears throat> very informative press conferences, very witty and thoughtful and uh, unlike what we have today. So, um, and then I met him, well, I actually at that press conference, at that um, uh, rally afterwards, I took his photograph and I uh, shook his hand and I blew off my brownie camera with the bulb three inches from his face and he flinched. It was very rude of me. I realized immediately to blow off an explosive flash bulb in his face, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, he was, he immediately smiled and recovered, but I, it made me aware of his vulnerability, I think, that and being close to him uh, at, at another time. And uh, I, I wrote a short story in October 61 about his assassination for freshman year in high school. So I was worried about that even then. I was a student of the Lincoln assassination and um, I had some awareness of how these things happened. So my story was called The Plot Against a Country. So I knew it would be likely a plot if somebody was assassinated and the the story was kind of silly and uh, not very well written but i got into things like the autopsy and the the investigation and uh it was rather prescient so when he was killed in 63 uh i wasn't totally uh surprised like a lot of people were but i i heard it at a um high school, I was waiting in line in the cafeteria and some kids said Kennedy was just shot and I laughed because I thought it was absurd, but I looked at his face and he was not kidding. So I ran to a radio two blocks away. I knew there was a radio at a drugstore and I listened to it for 40, 40 minutes from 1240 to 130. And um, what, what was striking was all the early reports said the shots came from the front. They said they came from a hill or from uh, the railroad uh, bridge in the front and it was only at one o'clock they started saying all the shots came from behind from this building called the Texas School Book Depository and I was already a journalist I started publishing articles in 1960 and I realized something was wrong when they changed the story and they didn't explain it maybe if they'd explained it clearly it might have been different but 
something registered in me. There was something fishy here. And uh, I went back to school at 1.30. It was very depressing. It was raining. The rain had come from Texas to Wisconsin by that time. And there was an old lady crying on the street corner outside. And I went back to class. And we were having a religion class as a Catholic high school on the ethics of murder was our topic, if you can believe that. And we were discussing, is it ever ethical to kill somebody? And uh, an interesting topic. And, and then at 140, the principal broke in, said Kennedy was dead. So it was a very surreal day. And by then I went home and I, I kind of stalled going home. I don't know why. And I got home just in time to see Kennedy's, um, well, the ceremonial coffin on, um, taken off the plane, which we now know is an empty coffin. We didn't know that then, but um, that really made it come home. And that evening at 7.36, it was, I think, Oswald said on television, I'm just a patsy, and I believed him. I think I was kind of prepared for the fact because I had heard the early reports. Sometimes if there's a shooting or some kind of catastrophe, I tell people run to the television or the radio because contrary to official wisdom, the early reports are often more accurate than the later reports when they start distorting the story. And then I watched that night as Oswald was being dragged through the halls saying he didn't shoot anybody, didn't shoot the policeman, he didn't shoot Kennedy. And at midnight, he held a press conference and said he was not guilty and he asked for um, a lawyer which was pathetic and horrible uh, so by the end of that day i didn't believe the official story as it was emerging well your sense of intuition and your keen mind uh served you well um your research you know has included first person interviews with important witnesses this wasn't done from a distance um you've met a load of the more important researchers um, the information you're exposed to is vast. From what you've learned from your studies and experiences, um, how is the actual murder of JFK different from the official version of that crime? Well, yeah, about in my book, Into the Nightmare, which I spent 31 years writing from 82 to 2013, I spent about 200 pages on the Kennedy murder and about 400 on the murder of Officer Tippett, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, that was an underreported important aspect of the case. But <clears throat> I made some discoveries on the Kennedy assassination. One I made in the 80s, and I couldn't get it published. I wrote an article on it, but I go into it in my book. And uh, the only other book that really goes into this before mine is Douglas Horn did... Uh, four very good volumes on the Assassination Records Review Board. He was a member of that um, investigating committee, and he went into this memorandum I discovered in the FBI files. In the 70s, they released a lot of F raw FBI files that I went through, and I made some important discoveries about George H.W. Bush being in the CIA before he, he officially admits it, et cetera. Uh, but I found one from A.H. Belmont, who is a very high official in the FBI. I'm looking at the memo here as we're talking. This was November 22nd at um, 9.18 p.m. And he was um, right, summarizing some things. He said, um, I talked to a special agent in charge, Shanklin, in Dallas. He said, arrangements have been made with Carswell Air Force Base to fly one of our agents up to Washington with the rifle that was recovered by the police together with the fragments of the bullet taken from Governor Connolly in the cartridge cases. I told Special Agent Charge Shanklin that Secret Service had one of the bullets that struck President Kennedy and the other is lodged behind the president's ear and we're arranging to get both of those. Uh, and that is a really crucial uh, statement that was ignored all those years and has been seldom written about. Um, the memo itself was printed in Dale Myers' book on Tippett, but he didn't really comment on it. Uh, so there's a bullet lodged behind the president's ear, and this is in the evening of the 22nd when the autopsy was in progress, which went on from 8 o'clock uh, until about 11, uh, the official autopsy. There was a pre-autopsy surgery about 7 p.m. for about 10 minutes that Horn found witnesses to, in which they tampered with the body and removed evidence, but uh, Shank, um, 
Belmont may have been a little behind the curve. They might have, I think they took the bullet out from the president's right temple um, at that pre-autopsy. They were trying to remove evidence of shots from the front is what the point of that was. And they were taking parts of his head off. And um, one of the big things that people have discovered, all the witnesses at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, the doctors and nurses all said the shot the, the big wound in Kennedy's head was in the back. It was a grapefruit sized gaping hole through which his brains were coming out. And there were no other visible wounds except um, a couple people talked about maybe a wound in one of his temples and there was a small wound um, uh, right here in his forehead, which you can see on the autopsy photo. And there was the uh, tracheotomy in, in the front which was a shot from the front that when he came into the hospital was a pencil thin hole right through his uh, larynx area. And the doctor made a tracheotomy incision, which normally is a small cut. But by the time the body was taken to Washington, it was this gaping slash, which the doctor would not do. The tracheotomy was done to give him oxygen, try to revive him, even though he was basically DOA, he had a, he had a faint pulse, but um, Dr. Um, McClelland, who was standing right over his head at the back of the um, <clears throat> gurney, was looking down into his head for 15 minutes and saw this big hole. And then when the body gets to Bethesda for the official autopsy, there is this gigantic hole covering part of the top of his head and the side of his head which had not been seen by any of the uh, doctors or nurses at Parkland. So the, they were looking at a different uh, set of wounds. And so that's what Horn found out and other people had, David Lifton had talked about pre-autopsy surgery, which two FBI agents during the autopsy had recorded. Dr. Humes, the autopsist said, um, surgery was evident in the top of his skull. And Horn found actual witnesses to the fact that Dr. Humes had taken a saw and a hammer and smashed up Kennedy's head and they were trying to remove bullets. And so a bullet hit him in the right temple and that's what Belmont is mentioning. And there were witnesses, civilians and secret service agents saw a bullet hit him in the right temple and that was from the front. And that's really significant and that probably is the bullet that blew out the back of his head. And another bullet, as I say, probably hit him right here probably from the front, obviously, and a bullet here. And then he may have been hit in the back. There was a, a wound in the back of the uh, shoulder, which the Warren Commission moved up to the neck to uh, make the single bullet theory possible, which was crucial to proving that one man had done all the shots. But at the autopsy, the doctors expressed consternation that they couldn't find a bullet, which is strange, you know, and they did everything possible to find it. But Dr. Humes was shamming at that point. And uh, so Belmont's memo destroys the Warren report right there. Uh, you know, uh, he's a credible source and also there were other witnesses backing him up. If there was a bullet taken from behind his ear, it meant there was an extra bullet not accounted for in the evidence and also that they covered it up. So that was one of the discoveries I made. And I was able to expound on that in my book on Kennedy, for example. Well, the, the Kennedy assassination has so many facets. It can be boiled down to uh, simple evidence, some of which you mentioned, like a wounded temple and a blowout in the back of the head, which pretty much states, you know, where shots would have come from. But it's such a large case that, you know, you can get lost in it. Uh, you seem to have a handle on very much of it, and I don't think you just needed to focus on one on one particular issue uh, in your in your book on J.D. Tippett, Into the Nightmare, you did a fabulous job. But I'm trying to say, maybe uh, stumbling for words here, that I think you have a great overview as well. But you, you. subject many haven't focused upon well, or I'm not really sure if anyone, uh, anyone else to that extent has done the job that you have done. How did you choose to focus on Tippett and what was it like looking into this man's life in you know, with the uh, in comparison to the case or its involvement in the case? Well, what I chose to do was to cover both murders to some extent, although focus more on Tippett. But one thing I tried to do is write the book kind of for two audiences, one that knew a little bit about the case, but not enough, and that 
you know, people were confused by it. And I tried to lay out the basic facts and disprove the false story. And one thing I did was I took, there are only eight proofs in the Warren report that Oswald killed Kennedy proofs in quotation marks because they, they don't, they don't uh, hold up. But I took those, those eight proofs and I, and I dissected them uh, one by one with what we, na we learned later, what we knew then, and we've learned a lot since then. And I've showed that all of those things don't hold up. And for example, you know, a lot rests on the rifle they recovered from the school book depository. They actually found three rifles, but the one they entered into evidence was not the one they first found, which was a Mauser. They entered a Mar Mandelker Carcano. And John Armstrong, in his really thoroughly researched book, Harvey and Lee, proves that Oswald didn't own that rifle and he didn't own the pistol that allegedly killed Tippett. So that alone exonerates him. And he really went into tremendous detail about that. And so I try to cover that. And I covered the, um, I have a chapter I'm very fond of about the funeral and the television coverage because I'm a critic of the media. And I think it was, I saw this happening. It's the first time I became aware of it is how we try people in the media for crimes. You know, they're innocent. We're supposed to have innocent until proven guilty in our country, but it's the other way around. You're guilty until proven innocent, which is shocking. And the way it works is somebody is charged with a crime and everybody tends to believe, well, he must be guilty. And then they put him on, if it's a big enough case, they put him on television and, um, you know, say he's guilty. And you, I saw that happening live with Oswald. So it was a, it was a four day docudrama, as I talk about, you know, the shocking crime, capture the suspect, trial on television, sh and then dispose of him by killing him. And it's, it's the denouement, and then the funeral is the coda. <clears throat> and a lot of people said the funeral was a magnificent, wonderful thing that showed, you know, and the TV coverage showed how the media had come of age. And I, I take the opposite view that the media shamefully let us down by um, lying about the case and then uh, providing a consolatory kind of TV docudrama that purported to solve the case but did not. And I remember the Tuesday, Dan Rather talked about, he was one of the people who uh, is a suspicious figure in the case and one of the media people who seemed to be involved. I, I mean, one thing I found in the case, in the course of my book, is how many media people not only lied about the case, but actually may have been involved in the shooting beforehand. And Dan Rather seemed to have advanced knowledge of it. He, um, he ordered five camera crews sent to Dallas, which is a producer, camera and a sound person and the only including the live only live television hookup in dallas was at the trademark and the other two networks had only one camera crew which was normal so he he anticipated something would happen and um uh so he was he said that the tuesday when america went back to work made him feel good about our country because we, we put it behind us, we went back to work, the system worked. And I think that was profoundly wrong. The system did not work, the system failed. And I remember that Tuesday as a very deeply disturbing, depressing day. I went back to school and it was a feeling of utter loss and devastation. And so the funeral was not cathartic for me at all. It was, you know, beautiful spectacle, but it was, it didn't, I don't believe in this closure cliche that we have. I don't think there is such a thing. But uh, that Tuesday, I went to the uh, downtown bookstore, magazine store after school, and I got Life magazine that had the photos from the Zapruder film, you know, so that was an important day, too. So I, um, I write about that a lot, and then I go into Tippett. Now, how did I decide to focus on Tippett? Um, well, Tippett had been ignored largely by most researchers and by the official authorities, his murder was um, not really investigated properly by the Dallas police. They dropped the case when Oswald was shot two days later. And it is shocking that, you know, a police department, when a, when a policeman gets killed, they should continue the investigation of a brother officer. And they didn't. They dropped it. And uh, there was some some investigation that went on. Jim Lavelle, I interviewed, was the chief um, detective. And he gave me a very good interview, rather candid interview. And he told me, for example, a couple of important discoveries I made. 
he said that Captain Will Fritz, who was in charge of the investigation, told him the night of the assassination that basically they didn't have a case against Oswald for killing Kennedy. And um, so they should go after him for the Tippett murder. And the, the twisted logic of uh, blaming him for the murder of the policeman who was killed about 38 minutes later is um, people thought, well, if he killed a policeman while fleeing, he must have killed the president. And that's not logical doesn't prove anything and also it could be unrelated or it could could be just somebody panicking or whatever you know but that's the way the public kind of thought they were manipulated and I said to him how did you why did you think you had a case against him for Tippett and he said well we had witnesses well the witnesses are very fallible they're all over the map there were about 20 people there and uh, it's striking how how different their accounts are and I went into that in great detail and uh, also Henry Wade, I interviewed the DA of Dallas County, who gave me a, a quite, quite frank interview. Was, uh, you know, I started by, I went to his law office. He was a very engaging kind of rogue, uh, very corrupt. But, you know, I, I started with a lot of softball questions. And finally, he said, uh, couldn't you ask some more uh, difficult questions? You know, this is kind of boring. You know? <laughs> so I started hitting him with some really difficult questions. And I was struck by how little he actually seemed to know about certain aspects of the case. And I think he was maybe hiding some knowledge by pretending to be ignorant, but I think certain things he just didn't know. But he more or less admitted they didn't have a real case against Oswald. And um, they, uh, or Tippett even, and, and you know, he was kind of acknowledging that. And so I thought, okay, Tippett, is a key to the thing. Uh, David Bellin, who is a Warren Commission apologist and uh, he was part of their staff, said the Tippett murder is the Rosetta Stone of the case. And he meant it in the way that it solved the case by proving that Oswald killed Kennedy, which is absurd. But I think in a strange way, it is the Rosetta Stone of the case, but in a different context, different meaning. And um, so the police department didn't investigate it. And then the Warren Commission hardly investigated. I, I went back in those days, there was no internet and I had to go to the National Archives and Xerox documents. And I went into the Warren Commission files and there was a an interesting memo from Alfreda Scobie, who was one of the good uh, staff members who Richard Russell had brought on. And she wrote a memo saying in the spring of uh, 64, you know, the Tippett murder hasn't been investigated. Why don't we, uh, we should, we should really investigate it. So they, they ordered an FBI investigation and they did a 19 page report interviewing his family members and a few things, but it wasn't very, um, it didn't prove anything. And uh, they barely covered it as one of those things they didn't want to cover, you know, just like the Dallas police didn't really want to know officially what happened to Tippett. And then the House Select Committee in 78, 79 did some more research on Tippett, some valuable interviews, but very sketchy in a way, and uh, they didn't really do much on it. Gary Muir had done a book <clears throat> in 1971. It was unpublished, but it was circulating around a short book, about 100 pages long, pretty good book on the assassination of Tippett. And um, that was it. You know, nobody else had covered it. And Penn Jones Jr., who was a crusading Texas small town newspaperman in Midlothian uh, editor, a publisher editor and he was one of the first people on the case and um, he said to me he was a mentor to, of me and other people and I became friendly with him he was really a great guy I got along with him right away because two old newspaper guys recognize each other and he was a real truth teller and he said take one aspect of the case something that hasn't been covered properly and research the hell out of it so that's what I did with Tippett and you did a fine job on that and uh he was i could see the two of you working together it's uh something i'd like to be a fly on the wall for yeah um, well, another thing i'd never seen i'd never seen anyone besides you um get an interview with uh jd's father uh edgar lee tippett um you went all the way down you know to where they lived in texas and and sought him out and he spoke to you uh, from that impressive and dogged piece of research, what did you come away with? Yeah, he was a fascinating yeah, man. I went went to the East Texas, very bleak area where the, 
JD grew up old cotton producing area that had gone kind of uh, it, it's like a ghost town where I drove there and it was very grim and he was a spry old man he was I believe 90 years old when I met him and very lively very sharp and um, Dale Myers who wrote a, a book of apology about Tippett I should say he did a book on Tippett before me and it's very long and has a lot of facts and some of them some good research but uh, he, he basically takes any any actual research that challenges the official story and pooh poos it and then he debunks it supposedly in his end notes so the end notes are interesting more than the main text but he will just say something that's contradictory to the story and then just say well it's not true but anyway, he never interviewed Edgar Lee Tippett, and he said something about Tippett's parents. There's very little known about them. So I thought, well, you know, they're, Tippett's father's alive, and his stepmother, I'll go and talk to them. You know, as a journalist, I believe in trying to talk to everybody. And when I did my Frank Capra book and other film biographies, I interviewed family members and, and friends and relatives. Uh, you know, a lot of books, they just interview celebrities, whether it's films or history. But I find that the so-called ordinary people often have the real story, you know, the crew members of films or the, the witnesses or the family members who really knew or the colleagues who knew uh, Tippett or people like that, uh, hospital workers, etc. And so I went out to see Mr. Tippett and he was still working as a farm laborer as he'd done his whole life. His son had a farm and he was working every day. And he was very engaging and very nice man. Um, I felt kind of sad for him because he was kind of aware that there were stories about his son maybe being involved in the assassination. And, and uh, but, so I was talking to him about what he knew. And one thing he told me that really uh, was striking was that Mrs. Tippett, J.D. Tippett's widow Marie, told him a few days after the assassination that she had been visited by a Dallas policeman who told her what happened to her husband and uh, I later determined this policeman was William Menzel, who was the officer assigned to that district in Oak Cliff where Tippett was shot. Tippett was something like eight miles, nine miles out of his district, which is strange, when he was killed. But um, Menzel was supposed to be covering the district. He gave a uh, very kind of implausible story to the authorities that he was... Uh, having lunch in a cafe and then somebody told him at a certain point Kennedy was shot and you know very kind of lackadaisical kind of story but what Menzel told Mrs. Tippett was that he and JD had been sent to track down Oswald and Oak Cliff shortly after the assassination which means they were involved in the plot with the Dallas police because officially Oswald was not known by name to the Dallas police until 2.10 p.m. when they took him into the police station after arresting him at the theater. And he had two sets of identification on him. One was under a pseudonym and one was under Lee Harvey Oswald. And so there's no way they officially could have found him. And he had an address in Oak Cliff where he lived, but they had another address on file where he had previously lived. But so here these two policemen are sent shortly after 12.30 racing around Oak Cliff and other researchers and I have come up with uh, strange behavior of Tippett before the murder which occurred about 1.08 p.m. or 1.09 earlier than the Warren Commission has it. They had it at 1.15 because they had to give Oswald time to walk from the rooming house to the murder site and he was seen by his uh, landlady's uh, helper waiting for waiting at a bus stop or a corner at, by 103 or 104 so it takes about eight minutes or ten minutes to walk to the murder site about a mile away I've walked that walk many times and so he couldn't have made it there be, before about 12 uh, 112 or a little after and the um, uh, hospital report says he was DOA at 115 and the Warren Commission changed that you can actually see they typed over the time to change it because it was inconvenient but Tippett was probably shot at by 108 he made a call to the police dispatcher at 108 and they didn't answer and uh, other indications are he was shot around that time it could have been as early as 106 but uh, anyway um, 
so what happened was uh, Tippett was uh, running around and he um, was waiting at a uh, gas station for Oswald to come across the viaduct from downtown, which was a straight shot to downtown Dealey Plaza. You can get there in about five minutes or so under good traffic conditions. And Tippett didn't see Oswald get off the bus because he had switched from a bus to a cab. So Tippett took off at a high rate of speed and was racing around. And then he stopped a guy in a car and he pulled him over and he, he looked in the back seat and uh, frantically looked in there and then he took off and he went to a uh, record store and made a phone call under great agitation. Nobody answered and he took off and then the last, then he was seen getting killed shortly after that. And uh, according to Mrs. Tippett, uh, the off other officers said, I, w I got into a traffic accident, didn't make it to the scene, and J.D. made it and he got killed, and he felt bad about it. And he was actually, his wife was interviewed, this policeman's wife was interviewed by Myers later and said uh, Mensel was always guilty about not making it there, and J.D. got killed. And I found evidence there was a uh, car accident about two blocks away, right around that time. And Mensel was the officer called to respond to the incident. And the odd thing is he said he was only on the scene for a minute or two, which doesn't make any sense. If you go to a car accident, no matter how routine, you have to take information, et cetera. Um, you know, on the other hand, there was a crisis going on, but uh, it kind of is validation that there was this car accident. So I think Tippett drove into an ambush and what they were doing why they were tracking Oswald is not clear. It could have been just to arrest him or it could have been to kill him. And I lean toward the killing him scenario because I think he was supposed to be killed on the street or the backup would be killed in the theater. He escaped being killed in the theater by, there were a lot of cops there, but he was shouting, uh, I am uh, not resisting, not resisting ar arrest. Yeah, not resisting arrest. And so it, and there were witnesses there, et cetera. And so as Dwight McDonald later wrote in Esquire, Oswald survived miraculously for two days in the hands of the Dallas police. And uh, so I think Tippett was sent to uh, kill him. And uh, but he was driving into an ambush and he was there was a police car in the alley, which had been unacknowledged. But a couple of witnesses saw the police car. Tippett's car stopped in a, blocking a, an alley between two houses and um, there was a police car seen in the alley and somebody came out of the police car and shot Tippett and uh, uh, administered a coup de grace to his head and went back toward the car and this was witnessed by people and none of this is in the official version. And so I think the Dallas police were involved in the killing of Tippett, and then the question becomes why, and so I investigated that, and who, is, who are the suspects in that case. But this, just to say, and we can go into this, that it seemed like there were two sets of witnesses that about half of them said Oswald did it, and about half said uh, it didn't look like Oswald. There was two men, or somebody got into a car, took off, et cetera. Two guys ran in different directions, and, and it's, it's, it's like Rashomon, the Japanese film. It's very, very confusing. It took me a long time to sort this out. And I really do believe there actually were two sets of witnesses. And Jerry Rose wrote a piece in the um, 80s, I believe, uh, postulating that Jack Ruby helped set up the Tippett murder scene. And a lot of the witnesses were staged witnesses who he had sent there. A lot of them had connections with Ruby, oddly enough. So we can go into that. Well, if I just bring up one off the top of my head, and I know you're well versed in um, Helen Markham, like I've seen in the men who killed Kennedy being interviewed, and I mean no dispersion. I don't mean you know to to speak ill of the poor woman, but uh, I think it was Joseph Paul on the Warren Commission. His quote was, "She was a total nut," and that you know when you see her in the video, she covered her face with her eyes. She said because she couldn't look. Then she said, I opened my fingers and I did a little peekaboo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, she didn't seem like a woman who was well, and yet she seems to have been the preeminent witness at the scene. Um, what did you make of Helen Markham? Yeah, I think the quote was utter screwball, which is even worse. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, she was a poorly educated person, so you do have to feel kind of sorry for her. But yeah, it, it came out later. She had a son who was in criminal trouble. He had done some uh, a break-in, and he was on probation. So she had reasons to be um, susceptible to police pressure. So I suspect, as other people have, that she was pressured to testify the way they wanted. Some of her testimony, she, she did say Oswald shot Kennedy and ran off, but yeah, as you say, she was hiding her face and, you know, other things like that. She got hysterical at the scene and left her shoes on top of the police car. And then Lavelle told me he had to give her smelling salts at the, uh, at the uh, uh, show up, you know, the, the, the lineup, because she kept fainting, and, which is strange, you know. And uh, at first she wouldn't identify Oswald at the, uh, sh at the lineup, which is interesting. And in the Warren Commission testimony, it's very interesting. They keep telling her now, who is the uh, person you identified? And she, she couldn't answer it. And the guy kept asking her different questions. And finally, he gave her a very leading question. He said, it wasn't a number six or whatever the number was. And, oh, yeah, right, right, right. But she also said the shooting occurred at 106 because she was walking to a bus. She was a waitress downtown. She was acquainted with Jack Ruby, who went to her uh, restaurant every night for for food and uh, she was walking to the bus which came at 112 and she she always walked from her home at one o'clock to get to the bus and so she knew the route and she had to get the bus or she would lose her job so her her time factor is pretty accurate so that was inconvenient for the report you know but she also was not the greatest witness in other ways but she was their star witness and so you have these warren commission documents saying she was a terrible witness and you know she all kinds of problems with her testimony and so um to hang the case on that is is really crazy the other thing they hung the case on was the ballistics evidence which is more important because witnesses can be fallible uh, but the ballistics evidence, as I went into detail in my book, exonerates Oswald because they couldn't link the, uh, uh, the bullets or the cartridges that they found to Oswald's supposed gun, which, in fact, he didn't own that gun. And there was some talk about how the gun had been substituted later, etc. But um, if you can't link him with ballistics, then you're stuck with the witnesses and the witnesses contradicted each other. So I think he was exonerated by the ballistics evidence. I, when I read into the nightmare, I read it actually three times and, and glanced through it other times. Um, it was fascinating to learn more about Tippett from your work. Um, I didn't, you know, learn more about him and his experiences in the war, possibly picking up uh, post-traumatic stress disorder that maybe affected him as an officer where he couldn't look people in the eye. Um, what, in, in those aspects, how do you look at Tippett? And um, in your own words, without me leading you too much, because I just did a little with, you know, but it was your work I alluded to. But um, how do you think he might have fit into the killing? Well, he was... Not a terribly intelligent guy, everybody kind of agreed, and he was a plotting policeman who had never been promoted in 11 years and had an undistinguished record, but um, so why would they pick a guy like that? His father also told me Tippett was an amazing shot, which contradicted the, the police records had only one record of his shooting prowess. They're supposed to have an annual report on somebody's shooting, they go to a shooting range and and they had a report from the 50s saying he was a mediocre shot, but his father said, no, he was a great shot. They'd go out walking in the woods and he would see a bird, you know, long, far away and he would shoot it down, you know, just lift his rifle. And so, I mean, that's interesting. He was a paratrooper in World War II. And as you say, he suffered PTSD. He was traumatized by uh, parachute jumping and the war. And uh, he was a machine gunner for a while. And uh, so he was, uh, he came back as a nervous wreck, as, as his father and other people said. Even the police um, report when they um, uh, hired him, uh, some of the investigators said the, the, boy, the boy was very nervous, et cetera. But, uh, but he had that problem where he couldn't look people in the eye, which is a sign of PTSD. And it's a fatal, possibly fatal thing for a policeman. Various people told me that. <clears throat> because if you're confronting a suspect and you can't look at them, they can get the drop on you. And that could have happened with the person who shot him. Um, 
his mistress, Johnny Maxie Witherspoon, who I interviewed, confirmed that he had that problem, you know. And uh, he was uh, he was not particularly political as far as I could tell. I could I could find little evidence of his political beliefs. Um, his widow claimed that they both voted for Kennedy in 1960, but I, I don't know, you know, that doesn't seem very uh, reliable that she said that. Um, some people like to claim that he was a Klansman or something. I, I did interview his oldest friend, Morris Brumley, who knew him as a, as a boy and was a policeman at the time of the shooting. And he, uh, Brumley, actually pulled out his Ku Klux Klan membership card while we were doing the interview. I was having lunch with him and he, he pulls out his wallet and he shows me his KKK membership card. It was a surreal moment. I had my tape recorder going right in front of us, and he he said he had infiltrated the Klan for the Dallas police in the 50s, and I told that to a Dallas researcher later, and he laughed. He said, well, infiltrated the Klan. About 75% of the Dallas Klan were Dallas policemen. It's a very racist department. And uh, I said to Bromley, I was trying to keep a straight face, because when you interview somebody, no matter how appalled you are, you have to just try to keep them talking. And, so I said, well, what did you do? And he he started boasting about how they had castrated some black guys and uh, beat beat them and whipped them. And, you know, it was really shocking stuff. And I finally, I kind of betrayed my feelings by saying, did, why didn't you report some of these crimes? You know, and, and then he kind of froze up and unfortunately stopped talking about it. But um, so I but I couldn't find any evidence. Tippett was a Klansman. But he worked for da uh, Austin's Barbecue, which was a uh, diner across from the police station where he was based in uh, Oak Cliff. And Austin Cook, who I interviewed, very charming kind of guy, but he was a right wing uh, John Birch Society member. And Austin's was kind of a hangout for a lot of the right wingers in Dallas. Bill Alexander, deputy DA, who was a very right wing fanatic, hung out there and various people. And uh, Austin had a uh, partner in business, Ralph Paul, who was also Jack Ruby's main business partner, and he financed Jack Ruby's nightclubs, et cetera, which is an interesting connection. And uh, Austin told me they had General Walker as a guest at one of their uh, John Burt Society meetings. Tippett was a um, security guard at this place on weekends at the time he was shot. He had been there for a couple of years. He also worked as a security guard at a theater and and uh, but he was known as a kind of a tough guy who would keep the teenagers in line at this um, at this diner, which was a very popular hangout. And there was a waitress there, Johnny Maxie Witherspoon, who was uh, unhappily married, and she and Tippett began an affair. And I got a very candid interview with her, very interesting, frank interview. A couple of things she wouldn't talk about, which was interesting, but she was having this torrid affair with Tippett and. Um, his wife was suspicious of it, and but uh, ironically, Mrs. Tippett, after the assassination, she had heard that Tippett was involved with a waitress, so she thought it was Helen Markham. So she showed up with another woman and accosted Helen Markham, but it wasn't Helen Markham who was involved with her husband. But then she showed up at Austin's, according to Austin. He said she showed up and she was suspicious of uh, of what happened there. And so she, Mrs. Tippett kind of knew that there was some philandering going on. And also he had, Tippett had been involved with another uh, woman before that. And there were reports that Mrs. Tippett on the morning of the assassination had asked, uh, or had been told by JD that he wanted a divorce. But I, according to the mistress, uh, she said that Marie wanted the divorce, which is very different. I couldn't get an interview with Marie Tippett, I tried. And um, she doesn't give interviews very much, except to a few very selected, sympathetic um, Warren Report supporting people. And I, in 2014, they had, after my book came out, they had a 90th birthday celebration for Tippett at the Sixth Floor Museum in Dallas. And I went there, and Mrs. Tippett appeared with her surviving children, and Hugh Ainsworth, who's this um, assassination apologist, was the host and I went up to Mrs. Tippett afterwards and introduced myself. She seems like a nice person and 
I she she was friendly and smiled, and I said, "Hi, I'm in town briefly, and could I come and see you tomorrow? I'd love to interview." And she said, "Oh, uh, yeah." She was indicating that she'd be willing to do it, but she had a police minder who. Gary Mack was standing there, who was the head of the Sixth Floor Museum, who was a uh, former researcher who had sold out and become the head of the museum for 200,000 a year and was uh, turned against the research community and supported the, pub the official version. So he was furiously shaking his head at this cop, like, get rid of Joe McBride, you know. And so um, this cop came over and kind of interrupted the interview and said, hi, um, I'll take your uh, card, you know, and I'm in charge of scheduling her appointments and we'll get back to you. Of course, they never heard back from them. And Mrs. Tippett kind of melted away. It's disappointing. I really wanted to talk to her about a few things, especially the last lunch that she claimed he had with her the day of the shooting, which and she's given a lot of contradictory stories over the years to various people. And I wanted to find out the facts because I suspect that that didn't happen. Um, but I couldn't ever get an interview with her, and I've tried since then, and just not getting anywhere. And I was talking to Curtis Tippett, who was his youngest son, who was a very nice man at that same event, and we were having a nice chat, and this policeman came over and actually grabbed Curtis by the arm and pulled him physically away from me. It was very bizarre. So uh, th that goes along with a researcher in Dallas who told me that Mrs. Tippett has been surrounded by police guards ever since and they keep an eye on her and uh, keep her from, you know, protect her from being questioned too much. And how how long did that go? You mentioned a timeline, but I'm just curious to stress it. How long were they still protecting her into the future long after the this uh, her husband died? Even today, uh, the last I heard that she gave a speech at a, a library uh, uh, about a year ago, I think it was, and I had a fellow researcher asked him to go there and they had cops there with her you know so they're still kind of protecting her which is interesting isn't it that they they want to uh, keep her from talking and she never gave testimony to the uh, Warren Commission and she talked to the House Select Committee informally not under oath but didn't say much you know so she's never really been uh, interrogated properly um, with Tip, you went into Miss um, Witherspoon, who you found, and you went into his love life. I was just wondering if there was any other pertinence possibly to that anywhere tied to the case, or did that end there? Was it just like a sidebar of his character, or was there any more that maybe was pertinent to the case? Well, there has been a theory advanced by various people that the murder had nothing to do with the Kennedy assassination that um, Tippett had impregnated Johnny Maxey Witherspoon and she had a child in early 64, a daughter. And uh, so she would have, her pregnancy would have been known by November 64. She probably got pregnant in September. And, uh, but she denied to me that Tippett was the father. And she told me another thing that had never been reported. She said Tippett had a vasectomy which was possible in those days, although rare. And, uh, but she had a husband who was very jealous and um, freaked out about her seeing Tippett, and he was following them around. <clears throat> so there was a theory the jealous husband maybe shot Tippett. And that another aspect is that maybe Tippett was meeting Johnny Maxey in, in Oak Cliff to be told that she was pregnant. There was a report by the next door neighbor that Tippett lived at the apartment house um, right two doors down. And, uh, but the one thing Johnny Maxey wouldn't tell me clearly was where were you when Tippett was shot? She was vague about it. She admitted she was in the vicinity, but she claimed she was some distance away, but she would never be pinned down on, she was very specific about almost everything she wouldn't tell me where they met to have sex. I, I I guess that it was at the diner late at night, but she wouldn't also tell me the address of where she was. She said she was doing the laundry when she heard he was shot. But um, it, it makes you wonder, was he supposed to be meeting her? Was the husband there? But the husband was supposed to be uh, en route to his job at a liquor store in another part of town. And there was an incident where a, a couple researchers went to a... Uh, 
bar and, and tried to talk to this guy and he threatened them. But Greg Lowry, who's a Dallas researcher, who's done a lot of good work on Tippin, helped me a lot. He, he knows a lot. He thinks the jealous husband theory was a clever theory that people came up with to try to distract attention from what Tippett was really doing at the time of the assassination. And he discounts it and he says, look at all the mileage they've gotten out of that. I don't think the jealous husband killed Tippett. But, Sorry, continue, sir. Well, Tippett was having a crisis. There was a marital crisis going on. <clears throat> she claimed, uh, you know, they had an affair and then it stopped for a while. And But um, he was he was overextended. He, he owned two homes, which is very unusual for a guy who made $438 a month, which wasn't much in those days. They had a home and then uh, they left it in 61, but they kept it and they were renting it out. And he was working, you know, part-time jobs to make money. And um, he was overextended financially. So he was vulnerable to financial offer. And I also found out from his father that he had bought a, um, I think it was a pickup truck for his father as a present soon before that. And they had all taken a big vacation to the Grand Canyon soon before that. So some evidence of money coming in. And uh, also, you know, Tippett was at this diner surrounded by these right-wing People. There were other right wingers who hung out there, as well as a lot of cops. And so he was the kind of guy they might have noticed. Here's this cop, good shot. He's around the area. We maybe could make use of him, you know, and, and get him involved in the uh, shooting, even though he was kind of dumb. There was uh, an interesting uh, verbal uh, ambiguity there. There was a cab driver at the corner, and he said when the supposed shooter passed him. He didn't see the shooting because there was a, tr a brush in front of him, but he heard the shooting and somebody walked past him, who some people said was the shooter, and he said he heard this guy say either poor dumb cop or poor damn cop. And it's not clear which he said, but, you know, it, it's an interesting question. I say, was he a poor dumb cop or was he a poor damn cop? You know, those are kind of different. He might have been both to some extent. It was funny when you mentioned that they he the house near the scene. Um, this is a stretch. It just came into my mind as you were speaking. I'd never thought about it before. Is it possible? And it's possible. I'm just again, it just popped in my head. Uh, something like that could that have been a safe house? Well, there was a safe house in um, Oak Cliff of Cuban exiles who, as we know, were involved in the assassination. Some of them. There were a lot of suspicious Cuban exiles who hated Kennedy because of the Bay of Pigs and and other things. And uh, there was gun running involved. Jack Ruby was involved in running guns to Cuba. And But there was a safe house in that neighborhood. And there was a suspicious policeman named Harry Olson who was around the neighborhood at the time. In my book, I, uh, I, I that's not on that block. It's, it's, you know, it's near there, but not, but close. Um, in my book, I try to talk about different suspects. Um, but, one of the best witnesses is Aquila Clemens, who was a lady who was a domestic who was working half a block away, and she heard the shots and came out, and she saw two men going in different directions, neither neither of whom resembled Oswald. And she said the shooter was a short and chunky kind of guy, which resembles Jack Ruby. Ruby may have been at the scene, and he may have helped orchestrate it. And, um, but some people said the shooter looked like Oswald, or was Oswald, but some of them wouldn't identify him, like Domingo Benavides was the closest person to the shooting. He was in a truck across the street, and he refused to identify him, so they didn't even call him to a uh, lineup. But <clears throat> later, his brother was killed in a shooting in a bar, and then he started, he told CBS, yeah, it was Oswald. And Warren Reynolds was a used car salesman nearby. He saw what he thought was a shooter run by and would not say it was Oswald. And then he got shot in the head two months later. Some guy broke into his um, car lot and shot him in the head, and then he started saying, oh, yeah, it was Oswald. So, you know, the, the identifications of Oswald were suspicious, and some of them were Jack Ruby-connected people. <clears throat> but um, it's as I say, there were like two sets of witnesses almost, uh, you know, with antithetical stories, which uh, is very strange. But... You know, it's, the whole thing was set up. Jack Ruby tried really hard to tell the Warren Commission who's involved in the uh, plot, but they wouldn't listen to him. If you read his testimony, it's quite extraordinary. And there's a book called The Yankee and Cowboy War by Carl Oglesby, which has a brilliant gloss on his testimony. He was trying to say, well, you know, 
I was involved in things, and Earl Warren was pretending not to know what he was talking about. And, and Ruby says, well, yeah, but you don't know the situation here, you know. But they wouldn't listen to him. They wouldn't bring him to Washington to tell the truth. Um, so anyway, the safe house question, who are the suspects if it's not Oswald? I don't think Oswald shot Tip, but John Armstrong in his otherwise really good book, Harvey and Lee, and he's done some additional research into the Tippett killing since my book came out, some of which is a good research. But he thinks Oswald shot Kennedy. Now, there were two Oswalds, as, as uh, Armstrong proves, which at the time we would have thought that sounds very bizarre. But that theory came out as early as 1964 because there are a lot of contradictory stories that Oswald was seen in one place at the same time he was in another place, et cetera, many stories like that. So some people tried to make sense of it, and somebody wrote a book about that, but um, uh, Armstrong did this very thorough book, and like one of the things he showed that was amazing was the morning after the assassination, at about 9.30 in the morning, a principal of a junior high school in Fort Worth got a call from the FBI and said, get to your school, you know, in half an hour, and they went there, and two agents came and took the records of Oswald from the school, and they were never seen again. And what's interesting about that is Os the historical Oswald that the Warren Commission tells us about was going to school in New Orleans at the time. So how could he be in two schools at once? And also it raises the question, how did the FBI know about this so quickly? Well, there are a lot of indications the FBI and the CIA were um, fully aware of Oswald. They were tracking him and CIA was running him. You know, Armstrong's theory is there were two, two men who had shared the identity of Oswald. And that may seem bizarre, but in spycraft, that is not uncommon for two or more people to share an identity for different reasons. And um, he calls one Harvey and the other Lee. And the day of the assassination, there were a number of official reports that called him Harvey Lee Oswald, which is interesting. And they were not just mistakes. But where I differ a bit from Armstrong is he seems very convinced that you know, at this point it's Harvey, at this point it's Lee, and I don't think we know enough about each instance to be able to say definitively this was this guy and this was that. But two people were arrested at the theater, for example. One was arrested in the balcony and he was let go. And so his theory is that both of them wound up at the theater and one's job was to implicate the other, who he calls Harvey, and Harvey would be the one who was shot. Um, but Armstrong has done some speculation about suspects and I also listed a number of possible suspects including the husband of Mrs. Witherspoon but also Harry Olson and um, there was a, a fellow who was an associate of Ruby who was a petty criminal who who indicated he didn't quite confess that he was involved but he dropped big hints that he might have been one of the shooters and and then there was the theory about Roscoe White who was a Dallas policeman who had a lot of suspicious connections and I examined the possibilities of these different people being involved and at this point it's a cold case you know more than 50 years old and it's hard to prove but so we're assembling evidence there was a guy named uh, Turk Vaganov who was in the area who looked a lot like Oswald who was this guy who showed up right before the assassination from Pennsylvania and he lived in that area and he behaved oddly that day and the FBI actually went to see him that afternoon he might have had something in, uh, to do with it, but um, other researchers, Armstrong and others, have done further research, which I welcome because I think when you do a book, one of the reasons I do books of any kind is to hope to encourage other researchers to delve into things. And in the case of Tippett, I wanted more study of Tippett. Let's get other people involved. I don't want to be the only researcher out there doing this stuff. And uh, uh, so other people have picked up the ball and they've run with it and uh, they identify a couple of people William Westbrook who was the head of personnel in the police department Armstrong thinks was a major suspect and he may have been driving this car that was in the driveway of police car and um, there was another policeman Kenneth Croy who was a reserve officer who was on the scene as I mentioned in my book a policeman was there Right after the shooting, one of the ladies at the corner house ran outside and she said policemen were there, which is very unusual because the um, official report 
is that it took about 10 minutes for policemen to show up. So why would a policeman already be there? And so um, Armstrong theorizes, and there is some genuine weight behind what he talks about, that Westbrook was organizing a lot of the framing of Oswald and uh, the, the organizing the flight of the suspect in the and the scene at the Texas theater and, and some of the um, evidence that was uh, involved, like the wallet and the gun and the and the jacket, and that he had this guy Croy as as a um, <clears throat> an accomplice, and that Croy probably shot Tippett is Armstrong's theory. So it is an open question uh, who who killed him. Uh, just like with Kennedy, we don't really know who shot him. And we may never know the identities of people in Dealey Plaza. We know that there was more than one shooter. And there were probably three shooters or more. There was somebody on the grassy knoll firing in a policeman's uniform from behind the um, concrete retaining wall close to the limousine. And then there was somebody behind the picket fence further down the hill. And then there was a, a drain pipe hole that I've seen at the edge of the fence where uh, somebody could stand in the hole and fire and they had a good line of fire. And then there was probably a shot from the um, Dal Tex building behind the president and it was in line with the shot that hit him in the back. And there, there was probably a diversionary shot fired or maybe more than one from the Texas School Book Depository, but from a different window from the one Oswald was allegedly in, which he was not in because he was on the second floor in the lunchroom at the time, apparently. So there were probably three or four shooters there and probably uh, more gunshots fired. You know, there were definitely more shots fired than the three that were accounted for. And um, also, we have found out another thing that some of these things, you know, if you told me this stuff in 63, I would have had a hard time believing it, that the Zapruder film has been altered. I was an agnostic on that for a long time, as I was for a while on the alteration of the body. But the Zapruder film, Douglas Horn proved through interviewing CIA photo experts, they worked on two different versions of the Zapruder film that weekend. They were brought in by the Secret Service, two different teams of uh, photo experts, very reputable experts. Uh, the, the one who is the world's greatest photo expert, Dino Brugione, worked on a version of the Zapruder film, which is not the one we have today. And uh, for example, the car comes to an almost complete stop, which they've removed from the film, and they sort of sped things up. And then uh, the the, the um, debris from the head shot goes straight up in the film for like one frame in the film we see, but he said it was more, there were more frames which would be logical. And it went backwards, it exploded backwards because there's a policeman in a motorcycle behind him who was hit in the face with debris. He said it was so strong that he felt he had been shot in the face, for example. And uh, I interviewed Senator Ralph Yarborough, who was riding in the car with Johnson, President, Vice President Johnson, two cars behind the limousine. And he said that when the shooting occurred, um, the car, the motorcade came to uh, almost complete stop, is the way he put it. And that's what a lot of witnesses said. And he said, Poli uh, Secret Servicemen swarmed around the presidential car. You don't see that on the Zapruder film. And he said, I thought an explosion had gone off inside the car, is the way he put it. And so they removed that evidence. That would be very damning. And that's what uh, Horn thinks is why they altered the film, partly to eliminate evidence of shots from the front, but also um, to eliminate this very damning evidence that the uh, driver, William Greer, hit the brakes, which is provable from the extant Zapruder film. You can see the brake light come on. But he, he pulls the car to a stop. And the protocol was if, if there's gunfire or disruption, you hit the accelerate and get the hell out of there. And he didn't do that. He hit the brakes. And so it gave the uh, shooters a chance for a good final volley of shots. And uh, uh, if you see Secret Servicemen around the car, it's very different from just Clint Hill, the one agent jumping off the car. And when you see the Zapruder film now, it looks kind of hard to believe that he could reach the car that quickly. He's running at almost a superhuman pace, jumping on this moving car. It seems to defy logic. So um, there's there's a, a lot of 
I guess my point there was we don't know who the shooters were in Dealey Plaza. We may never know their identities, you know. Well, I'd just like to mention, like, another aspect. Uh, just gives me a chance to remember my father, who was NYPD, and uh, my Uncle Jim, who was NYPD. Mm. And, uh, you know, you glean something from them being in the family, and, and I just can assure you there are cops out. You know, there are sometimes cops take a bad rap for the bad ones, but mm. there are some really good ones, and, and they were great men, are great men. My Uncle Jim is uh, is living in Florida. And um, I just know that once a policeman was shot, you know, if he knew something about the plot, one, it would silence tip it. But two, once a policeman was shot, um, they were going to find him. I mean, I would mm. stay beyond the shadow of a doubt that uh, that would have changed the atmosphere even more intensely against Oswald if they thought he had shot Tippett. Um, I don't, I'm sure some people in Texas supported Kennedy. Um, many obvious quite obviously did not but once a policeman was shot i would say possibly for the next few hours with adrenaline rushing all bets would be off what would yeah. you say to that well yeah that was a discovery i made i mean this is obvious when you listen to the police radio uh yeah there were honest dallas policemen and other people a lot of honest civilians so the, those are people we you know, Roger Craig was a Dallas sheriff's deputy's hero in the case. He told some truths that were inconvenient. He wound up probably being murdered for that. But um, in the police radio, I noticed they're very blasé when Kennedy was shot. You know, president was shot in the head. Oh, okay. No, no big excitement. But then it says a uh, policeman was shot out here in Dealey Plaza. And suddenly everybody gets excited. Their voices rise in the pace of transmissions accelerates and they get very agitated as they do when a policeman is shot. And I confirmed that with Jim Lavelle. He said, yeah, when a policeman is shot, that takes precedence over everything else. That's, you know, understandable. Um, but that meant that the, the um, a lot of policemen were drained away from Dealey Plaza, the scene of the assassination, and were headed toward Oak Cliff, which may have been part of the reason they killed the policeman was to uh, disrupt the investigation. And also, as you say, uh, if somebody thinks a guy is a cop killer, the policeman and the public are going to be very uh, hostile to that person. And so they, they painted Oswald as a cop killer right away. And uh, that's, you know, terrible onus to put on somebody. And so he said, I didn't do it. And I, you know, he, he, he didn't, he was arrested for shooting Tippett, not for shooting Kennedy. And one of the things I found was he was never arraigned for the shooting of the president, only for the shooting of Tippett. He was charged with both crimes, but he was never arraigned for shooting Kennedy. I found an FBI document that showed that. People don't know this. And um, so, as I say, they, they got him on the Tippett rap, and that's what they were holding him on. And the Kennedy thing was almost incidental. And I asked Jim Lavelle, who was an interesting and fairly candid source, but a cagey old guy, I said, uh, is it true that you guys got more excited when Tippett was shot? And he said, yeah. And he said, we have a saying, an old, there's an old saying uh, that, uh, I said, how did you react when Kennedy was shot? And he said, well, there's an old saying, it wasn't no different from a South Dallas N-word shooting, is the way he put it. And he chuckled, kind of an evil chuckle, you know, wow. which was shocking. Shocking. Um, South Dallas was the heavily black area of Dallas. And, and uh, that shows the attitude of the policeman that killings in the black community didn't really matter much. And Kennedy was uh, regarded as as a as a African American, and that, that was they were very racist. And uh, uh, I, I was in Dallas once back then, and I was with a cab driver around Dallas, a black guy, and I said, "What's it like here racially?" He said, "Well, Dallas is not too bad, but." When you get a, you know, a little while outside of Dallas, it's like being back in the 1930s, you know, even even in the 80s, this was like that, or 90s. So in other words, um, they all thought, um, they didn't care much about Kennedy and they cared a lot about uh, policemen being shot. However, it's often pointed out, you know, they dropped the investigation of the Tippett murder. And if you have a brother officer, you should investigate his shooting. I mean, you know. But they didn't seem to maybe like Tippett very much. There were other Tippets on the force. There were two other Tippets, not related. But somebody said they were relieved when they found out it wasn't one of the other guys who was well liked. J.D. Tippett was 
either a loner or not very well liked for uh, there were rumors that he was a dirty cop who was involved in drug dealing even Alan Dulles in a Warren Commission hearing brought up with Chief Curry that you know the rumors about Tippett being involved in drug dealing and nobody could ever prove any more of that but um, he was not a uh, wholesome character and he had this uh, complicated love life and he was not a distinguished policeman so um, they didn't seem to care too much about him let's put it that way so they didn't investigate his murder and also it would be inconvenient to find out who really did it so they conveniently dropped the case well, in, in, in Into the Nightmare, my search for the killers of President John F. Kennedy and Officer J.D. Tippett, there's much more information I would recommend it to anybody. I've read it at least three times, and as I said, and also picked sections to read after those three complete readings. Um, was there anything else between the official story that you haven't mentioned yet and the reality of what happened by evidence uh, is, is a glaring one you might want to bring up, or did we cover most of that? Well, we've covered, I think, the highlights. There are many nuances. I have a whole section about the Dallas and Texas right-wingers and why the assassination might have occurred. Uh, a lot of the uh, oil men and the media, and, uh, the military-industrial complex people, as Eisenhower called it in Texas, was a place where, uh, you know, a lot of um, airplanes and helicopters were being built, which were used in the Vietnam War. And so the Vietnam War uh, was is seen as, as a, a motive for the killing. The Kennedy was winding down the Vietnam War. He had issued a pullout order and a thousand troops had been ordered to be pulled out in, uh, in October. And they were actually pulled out in December out of bureaucratic inertia. Johnson on November 24th, 63, this is very important, reversed Kennedy's decision to scaled down the war and he expanded the war with a secret presidential directive after meeting with um, Henry Cabot Lodge, the ambassador to Vietnam and McNamara and other people. And this was not known to the public. And so Johnson was preparing for a big war. And so these people in Dallas uh, and Texas profited mightily from the assassination. Johnson was corrupt and involved with some of them. And uh, for example, um, at one o'clock PM on Friday, when Kennedy was being pronounced dead in another room. Johnson was in a room at the hospital and he was on the phone to his tax lawyer in Houston, Wadi Bullion, great name. And he said, does this mean I have to sell my goddamn Halliburton stock? And Johnson was owned and operated subsidiary of the Halliburton Corporation, which had bought Brown and Root, the, the Houston construction company, which was uh, had corrupted him in the 30s and, and financed his whole rise to power by giving him a lot of money to distribute to Democrats around the country to make himself a national figure. And he did favors for them. He got them a big dam built in the 30s, for example, which was a huge boon to them and other um, construction projects. And they had uh, a big benefit from the Vietnam War. They they and a consortium of two other co companies built ca the, the port at Cam Ranh Bay, which was the main port in, in South Vietnam, and it, it was contract that was billions of dollars. So the Halliburton Corporation made a huge amount of money off. Um, <clears throat> they and this consortium had something like 97% of the construction contracts for the Vietnam War, which is a gigantic profit. And um, they brought you the, the Iraq War, for example, too, because Dick Cheney had been the CEO of Halliburton. And so this company uh, was involved with a lot of, you know, they even provided the the meals for the troops, you know, they were charging exorbitant sums to the U.S. government for lousy food for the troops in Iraq, for example, and also supplying a lot of the hardware. And, uh, you know, a big part of what we do in wars, we don't try to win wars anymore. We, we just blow stuff up and then we rebuild it, which makes a lot of money for the people who sell the arms and do the construction and then they they rebuild it and they make a fortune. Noam Chomsky, who's no friend of Kennedy, wrote a book and he claimed that even though it's said that we lost the Vietnam War, he argues that we won it in the sense that the people who profited from it did really well off the Vietnam War. It's the people who got killed who didn't do well, the 57, 58,000 Americans who were killed in the millions of Asians. But they didn't care about those people. Uh, but 
you know, you got to look at it from why do we have these wars? Is, why are we fighting in Afghanistan and why did we fight in Iraq? It's, it's to make money for the military industrial complex, as Eisenhower warned about in his farewell address. So I go into that a lot and I go into 35 pages on the involvement of George H.W. Bush in the assassination, which I was the one who revealed in 1988 with uh, articles in The Nation that caused quite a stir. I revealed his early CIA connections and then I was hoping other reporters would pick it up. But it, it was a big story for about 10 days and then the CIA denied it and the media dropped it. But I knew that the story was true and I figured in about 10 years it'll be vindicated and about 10 years later people started writing in books about it. So there have been a number of books. Russ Baker's book Family of Secrets is a good one I'd recommend on the Bush crime family and he starts with me discovering uh, an FBI memo about Bush and his CIA connections and, and uh, Bush was around. He was in Dallas on the the night before the assassination, he was there that morning and then he went to Tyler, Texas to give a speech and he flew back to Dallas. He arrived back when Air Force Two was taking off. Russ Baker and I disagree. Russ thinks that he and Barbara Bush went back to Houston that night, but I think he stayed over. But he, what was he doing in Dallas? There were three U.S. presidents. Um, well, there was Johnson. Actually, four, I'm sorry. Johnson, Kennedy, Nixon, and Bush were all in Dallas on the 22nd, which is quite remarkable. So I go into all that context. I try to give some sense of why the assassination happened. A lot of people have written many books about it, and, and I found that the more I research this case, the more complex it seems. There are more facets to it and more people involved. And um, it's a common cliche to mock assassination researchers by saying they believe in a vast conspiracy. But I think it was quite a, a large conspiracy because I kept finding out more and more people who were involved in this uh, indisputably. Like, I was surprised to find out that uh, Kenny O'Donnell, who was Kennedy's uh, chief of staff basically, was the inside man at the White House for the assassination. Uh, that really surprised me, but the evidence I found made it really clear and members of the press and other members of the government and military people and uh, you know it, it, it you can't shoot a president very easily I mean you know there have been cases occasionally where one person can shoot a president but it's hard to get to a president penetrate the security and so you have to corrupt the uh, bodyguards usually and they corrupted the Secret Service as Vince Palomero has proven several members of the Secret Service were uh, involved in letting it happen and also the whole turn on the Elm Street was against all the rules of the Secret Service and so the people who planned the motorcade were heavily involved and I went into the planning and the motorcade and O'Donnell was involved in that and other people. It was done in the offices of uh, the head of the Texas Democratic Party in Dallas and so um, the more I got into it the more I found you know how, how complicated this whole story is so it made it a long tale to tell. And I tried to do it all in one book, but I couldn't cover every facet. So I, some of the things I, I dealt with kind of in a condensed way and other things I expanded upon. Well, it's funny people, when people had said to me, um, how could this, you know, all these people be involved? It dawned on me one day, well, how many people were after Castro? I'd say the agency was involved. Uh, I'd say the mafia was involved. Mm -hmm. I'd say, um, you know, the FBI was involved to some extent. Um, and that pretty much sounds like some of the same cast of characters. We kind Cuban of ex Cuban exiles, of course, too. Yeah, and Cuban Cuban exiles as well. So that's kind of, to me that's kind of a large conspiracy, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, that's a smaller. But I mean, there's a head of state they were trying to kill, and um, uh, somewhat on a smaller scale, easier to do. But um, that took a lot of people. And uh, when you kill a president, that's a big, complicated. thing. Thing to pull off, but also just the fact to cover it up. You know, we learned in Watergate, I, I learned a lot from the Watergate cover up in the Church Committee investigation that the cover up is the key to the crime became a maxim. So if you study the cover up, who ran the cover up? Lyndon Johnson. He was in charge of the whole cover up. And the theft of the body from uh, Parkland Hospital, uh, one theory I advanced in my book that nobody, I don't think, had advanced before was that the coffin was empty when they took it out of the emergency room 
Uh, I think that's why they had this uh, almost a gun battle over the coffin. The Dallas um, medical examiner, Dr. Rose, was demanding they keep the body there for an autopsy, which was Texas law. And Kenny O'Donnell and the Secret Service, uh, it became violent. They were pushing the coffin back and forth. Mrs. Kennedy was there. People were cursing, waving guns around. I mean, it was extraordinary. That was one of the big moments when I read that in Manchester's book in 67 that really struck me. What's that about? And I thought, well, if the coffin is empty, that would justify a gunfight almost. And I think they spirited the body out of the emergency room. And I found a document that showed that they had a tunnel. There was a secret exit from the emergency room where they could take, they could go from the, the emergency room through a tunnel to the outside. And I think they took the body out that way. David Lifton, I, I think his theory is basically correct that they altered the body, but he claims they removed the body in the airplane. I don't think that's the case. I think they transported it some other way, um, but they they altered the body in uh, Bethesda Hospital. So, I mean, there are a lot of things, a lot of facets to this case that are unexplored that I got into. You know? Well, we kind of went into the strange, de there were strange deaths, you know, around, around Tippett, Domingo Ben. Benavides, the car salesman. I know Aquila Clement, Clements had been told to be, uh, you know, quiet about it by uh, law enforcement. But could Tippett, and this is a speculative question, so, you know, it's a question you have to ask given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Could, and you have addressed it before, so I've, I've read your answer, so if I, ha uh, my knowledge from this would come from having studied your work, but could Tippett possibly have been a shooter in JFK's death? And if so, um, what would lead us to, to possibly come and consider that conclusion? Let me just say that, yeah, there were a lot of suspicious deaths. Penn Jones was the guy who discovered this and made a long list, some of which maybe are dubious, but um, Eddie Benavides was the guy who was killed. He was the brother of Domingo. Domingo, I found, I tried to find him in Dallas and couldn't find him. And then I found in my chagrin that he had moved to Northern California where I live and I could have interviewed the man, but he died a few years ago, and I really regret that. But Were they twins? Uh, uh, no, just brothers who looked alike, apparently. Um, uh, that's why Eddie might have been shot, but it was a bar fight. And M Mrs. Clemens, who was a real hero, who bravely yeah. gave an interview, it gave interviews to a number of press people, and she gave an on-camera interview to Mark Lane and Emil D'Antonio for their film Rush to Judgment. And she was never seen again after that interview. And um, she she had said that the police a policeman showed up and threatened her with a gun, and she was warned not to talk about it. And I'm afraid that she might have been killed. And it's uh, nobody's been able to find anything about her. I found some evidence that she might have possibly turned up in Pennsylvania after that, but she would be dead by now anyway because she'd be uh, well over a hundred. But uh, I suspect she might have been killed, but uh, Tippett, uh, as a, as a suspect, is I go into that, and it's it's very speculative. But um, there was a there is that photograph by Marianne Mormon, a Polaroid taken at the time of the shooting, and uh, in in the background you see the concrete retaining wall and the grassy knoll. I've been there many times. It's a perfect angle to shoot from. It's very close to the president. But everybody was looking at the president. They weren't looking at the retaining wall. <clears throat> and uh, Zapruder and his uh, assistant were behind their filming. And uh, uh, in the image, as enhanced by Jack White, who was a photo expert who showed me his, his uh, images and his techniques, it, it, it shows that there was a Dallas policeman or a man in a Dallas police uniform, distinctive markings, etc firing what appears to be a gun with a flash. You see a flash. And at that range, you could shoot with a long uh, handgun accurately. And uh, you could kneel there. It's a, uh, You'd have to kneel to uh, fire, but you have a good place to rest your arm. So I think somebody was firing from there, and it's a perfect shot to hit him in the head. And that may be where the shot hit the temple. And um, it, 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 I, I noticed uh, that the hairline of the policeman is very similar to Tippett's very distinctive hairline. Tippett had a kind of a notch in his hair. And I found, one of the things I found very interesting in my research was that in the Warren Report, uh, Sylvia Marr, who wrote a great book debunking the Warren Report, said Tippett is unknown and unknowable. 
And one reason for that, I disagreed with her because I set out to prove that you could know this man, but um, one reason was they didn't run a current picture of him in the report, which seems peculiar. The only pictures of him were in 1952 and 1957, and in 63, he looked a lot different. He, was, he looked a lot older, he was thinner, he was wrinkled, he was... Uh, there, so I, I saw a picture of him at the Sixth Floor Museum in my research, and I thought, wow, he looks a lot different. And you see the distinctive notch on his hairline, and I compared that to the shooter. And I thought, wow, this, this is interesting. It, it really uh, matches. And, um, but, you know, Tippett's whereabouts at that time, his wife claimed he was home for lunch. But as I say, she gave different accounts of the time and the circumstances, et cetera. And there was a, a woman across the street who claimed she saw him leaving home. And I interviewed her a number of times. I managed to shoot down her story. It just didn't make sense. She was mistaken. She got it confused, I believe. And um, so I, w I wish I could quiz Mrs. Tippett more on that because he gave Tippett an alibi. And there was also a report of him investigating a um, uh, shoplifter in um, that area. And it is a considerable distance between there and um, uh, from where, uh, from his home to Dealey Plaza. So if he was at home, for lunch, he probably wouldn't have had time to get to the other closet. You wouldn't go for lunch if you're about to kill the president. So uh, that remains kind of an open question. But if he was able to be there, it's conceivable he was one of the shooters. And that, that conceivably would be a motive to kill him, to get rid of a shooter. Silence and, the assassin. Huh? Silence the assassin. Yeah, and I think when you think about this, that... Kennedy was killed at 12.30, Tippett was killed at about 108 or 109. So within 38 or 39 minutes, they would have, uh, and if he had killed Oswald, as they hoped, they could have wrapped it all up in 39 minutes. They'd have Kennedy killed and the, the supposed assassin and the heroic cop all dead within 39 minutes. And if Tippett was an assassin, he'd be conveniently dead too. And I mean, I've read people who say the Dallas police did an amazing job in solving the case because they captured Oswald within, uh, you know, I, I think he was captured at 1.52 p.m. Uh, but he wasn't the killer, so I mean, it's absurd. But uh, it, it, it all kind of is another piece of the puzzle that might explain Tippett's involvement. But also, it, would he have had time to get from Dealey Plaza to Oak Cliff in time to do what he had to do in Oak Cliff? And yes, he could have. Because the viaduct um, takes, and I've driven it, you can get across it in five minutes. Uh, there was a fair amount of traffic that day, but not on the viaduct, apparently, because the cab driver who drove Oswald said there wasn't much traffic, et cetera. So all the traffic was congregated downtown, but a police car could get through the traffic and take off from Dealey Plaza. There were cars in the parking lot behind uh, the grassy knoll. He could have... Um, gotten onto the viaduct and gotten to the next place he was seen was the Gloco gas station at 1245. That could, it could have been possible. So it's an open question in my mind. I'd just like to say when people come on uh, the shows, you know, of course they usually have a book and most of them are very good. Um, and most of the authors are very intelligent, but, um, I say in, in all honesty, um, aside from you know, having somebody on is kind enough to share their work with us. Uh, some of Joe's work has touched me deeply and, and changed the way that I thought. And uh, one of the books was definitely Into the Nightmare. And, uh, so, you know, it it's extremely thorough. I would, adv I would uh, advise people who are researchers not to miss it. And if you're interested in the case, you're going to find solid information here that you don't have to worry about if that information was in some way tainted or easily uh, easily not come to, not checked, because uh, this is a very scholarly work by a brilliant man. And as we close the show, I wondered if you'd give us a, a taste of the book by uh, giving us uh, some readings from, from it to close us out tonight. Well, thank you for your nice comments, Bob. And, and I, I should say, uh, you know, I wrote the book partly for people who don't know a lot about the assassination, which is fine people who are interested in it may know something, but it's not, you don't have to be a super expert. I tried to be clear about the basic issues. It gets into some 
arcane details as it goes on, but um, I do try to touch, you know, I, I do it on two layers, two levels, so I appreciate that. Uh, but I, yeah, I have some thoughts because um, I think, you know, a friend of mine said, um, do you write about, are you interested in current issues? You know, she was irritated that I wrote this book. As people used to be, you know, you'd get a lot of flack. And I said, well, this is a current issue. And then that sh shut her up kind of. Uh, because I think the nightmare we're living in now is the one that we walked into with the Kennedy assassination. When you kill a president, blow his head off on a public street at high noon and nobody is punished who actually did it. And it's a military coup. Uh, you, you know, all hell breaks, breaks loose, and then you have undeclared, you have wars that are illegal, you have stolen elections, you have this nightmare with uh, this pandemic that we have no leadership on, and it's, uh, you know, the world, uh, uh, we're, we're far ahead of the rest of the world in deaths, and it's not, it wasn't necessary for that to happen. So uh, I think all that stems from this terrible tragedy. So let me just read some things. Um, I quote Norman Mailer in 1960. He wrote a piece in November 1960 for Esquire called Superman Comes to the Supermart, which was a very prescient article about Kennedy's campaign and the, and the uh, uh, convention. He says, America's need in those years was to take an existential turn, to walk into the nightmare, to face into that terrible logic of history which demanded that the country and its people must become more extraordinary and more adventurous or else perish. And I was just reading a uh, quote from a psychologist who said today, uh, the 2020 election is a life or death issue for America, and that's probably true. So uh, now I'll read from the end of the book. This is the epilogue, and I start with Pr Charles de Gaulle saying President Kennedy died, died as a soldier under fire for his duty and in the service of his country. And then I go on. So now we know more about the murders of President John F. Kennedy and Officer J.D. Tippett. And yet we are still left in the position of living with many contradictions and ambiguities about these events, uh, about these crimes. I have tried to the best of my ability over a long period of research and writing to advance the process of understanding begun by other researchers soon after these events occurred and advanced since then by many admirable scholars of the case. I cannot claim to have solved the assassination or the Tippett murder, but perhaps in this painstaking endeavor, I have shed more light on these intertwined subjects, offering fresh insights into the overall conspiracy and on some previously obscure aspects of the murder in Oak Cliff shortly after the death of the president. This process of elimination, I believe, has enabled us to come somewhat closer to the truth. Among other things, we have clarified, although not entirely, what was happening with Lee Harvey Oswald and shown him to be the patsy in both murders. At this late stage, finding Tippett's real killer or killers is not possible, but we have sharpened the focus on the strange events involving the officer that culminated in his murder and, officer, and Oswald's arrest. We have eliminated some suspects in both murders, including Oswald himself, and propose some theories about aspects of these crimes that may lead to a clearer understanding of what happened that day. Was Tippett's death strictly a local matter, as J. Edgar Hoover claimed? I think not. Some facts will no doubt remain elusive forever, but more will emerge as time passes despite the deaths of witnesses and researchers and the surviving participants in the conspiracy. And we should remind ourselves that much is known about the case, not all is contradictory or ambiguous. We often hear the line from Warren Commission defenders that the assassination is an unsolvable mystery that we will never know what really happened. Some, sometimes the same is said of Tippett's much less discussed murder. But that notion is equivalent to the nihilistic belief that we should stop trying to understand what happened in history. Faulkner was wrong when he wrote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Forget about it and move on to the next unsolvable mystery. Our lives were are essentially meaningless, except it. Uh, I, I think the past is never dead. It's true. Among these postmodern thinkers, perhaps the best among these is novelist Don DeLillo, whose masterful assassination novel Libra is at heart a demonstration of what he considers the ultimate unknowability of that mysterious figure, Lee, Lee Oswald, and the facts surrounding what happened to him in Kennedy and Tippett. DeLillo writes in that novel, what has become unraveled since that afternoon in Dallas is not the plot, of course, but not the dense mass of characters and events, 
but the sense of a coherent reality most of us shared. We seem from that moment to have entered a world of randomness and ambiguity, a world totally modern in the way it shades into the century's, quote, emptiest literature. The study of what is uncertain and unresolved in our lives, the literature of estrangement and silence. Then I go on, that is a fashionable view, but I believe with the filmmaker Earl Morris that there is something known as truth, and the truth actually exists, even if it is often very difficult to find. This stubborn conviction puts me and my old college friend Errol Morris at odds with many supposedly more modern thinkers who don't believe in the concept of truth, only in the doctrine of endless ambiguity. In the assassination case so central to our modern history, postmodern shoulder shrugging is a convenient excuse for the ploy of keeping the public suspended in a state of knowing but not knowing. This clever maneuver amounts to piling more dirt on the graves of President Kennedy and of our democracy. The words of psychiatrist and assassination research doc, researcher Dr. E. Martin Schatz are worth recalling here. He wrote, it is so important to understand that one of the primary means of immobilizing the American people politically today is to hold them in a state of confusion in which anything can be believed, but nothing can be known, nothing of significance, that is. And the American people are more than willing to be held in this state because to know the truth as opposed to only believe the truth is to face an awful terror and to no to be no longer able to evade responsibility. And then I write, when my mentor Penn Jones told me that he and several other researchers had essentially solved the Kennedy case back in the 60s, he was correct that the broad outlines of what happened have long since been known, have long been known, however imperfectly. But it is also true that much has been learned since then. And although I've been studying this case intensively since 1982, I've could not have brought this search to a conclusion after all these years in 2013 without the benefit of the wealth of critical information and insights our community of scholars has turned up about the political context, people, and events of the case. Besides continuing to accumulate evidence through my own research, I've, I've absorbed the flood of documents and articles and scholarly books that have emerged in the past three decades and the two decades before that, an often invaluable body of insight. The U.S. government under public pressure has declassified most of the surviving documents about the assassination, but many vital documents have been destroyed since 1963, and the fact that some assassination documents still remain classified for national security, in quotes, reasons, and reasons of supposed personal privacy in the 50th year since the event occurred, now 56, is a telling fact that there is still much the establishment feels it is necessary to hide. Parenthetically, I'll say that President Trump said that he would declassify all the remaining documents as the JFK Records Research Act stipulated, and then the FBI and CIA pressured him to keep a lot of them classified. Back to the book. But the six million pages of previously hidden documents that were released through the work of the Assassination Records Review Board in the 1990s and the many independent studies published in the past decades not only have brought out fresh nuances and details of the case, but also have given us a much fuller understanding of what Peter Dale Scott, one of the most profound and essential researchers, calls the deep politics surrounding the assassination, the socio-political context from which the assassination arose. <clears throat> Since President Kennedy's death, as I've learned more about the Byzantine nature of the forces working against him, and about some of his own failings of leadership, I've come to a more subtle understanding of the man I worked for in the 1960 Wisconsin primary campaign. I've gone through some disillusionment over his early inexperience and recklessness, but I've not lost my essential admiration for his acute intelligence, his grasp of history and our role in it, his growth in office from a cold warrior to a man attempting to bring peace to a world imperiled by nuclear arms, and his imperfect but frequently enacted courage in the face of dawning circumstance. I still deeply admire him. I would not have spent all these years trying to solve the riddles of his death unless he still inspired me with his eloquence, his wit, his pragmatic idealism, and his boldness in attempting to lead us out of the nuclear abyss and neo-colonialist warmongering some of his own making into a more modern, more complex world of peaceful coexistence. The more I've learned about that valiant attempt, the more I admire him for he sacrificed his life in making it. I also admire his former adversary and latter-day partner in peace, Nikita Khrushchev, for sacrificing his high position to join Kennedy in saving the world from destruction. Has my long and obsessive process of studying and trying to come to terms with Kennedy's death been cathartic? 
cathartic? Not really. The pain endures. It always will. As the case recedes into history after 50 plus years and as the people directly involved pass on, for some the pain may seem to be somewhat, uh, uh, may seem to somewhat deaden, become more bearable. But for me, as I complete this book and therefore place it in the public arena, entering what DeLillo calls the room of theories, the room of growing old, for me, the pain remains as fresh and raw as it was on that first weekend. Robert Kennedy, in his overwhelming grief after the assassination, took solace from the philosophical truths he observed from Edith Hamilton's book, The Greek Way, a book Jacqueline Kennedy had given him in 1964. I, too, had read that book while attending Marquette University High School and found in the wake of this national tragedy that I could also draw some solace from the ancient Greek lesson that grieving is not devoid of purpose. RFK especially valued a line from Aeschylus's Agamemnon that he later quoted in the greatest speech of his life on the death of Martin Luther King Jr. to help bring a me measure of solace to a shocked audience of mostly African-American citizens. Fortunately, that speech was recorded on film for us to continue watching so we can keep learning from its wisdom. The words he quoted from Aeschylus, who he called my favorite poet, are also engraved in stone near RFK's grave in Arlington National Cemetery. The, the words are, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until I, in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. It's significant that Robert Kennedy slightly misquoted Aeschylus substituting for the Hamilton translated phrase, in, in our own despite, the words in our own despair. So that's my some thoughts from the final chapter of my book, Into the Nightmare. Well, my search for the killers of President John F. Kennedy and Officer J.D. Tippett in the Nightmare by our friend Joseph McBride. Uh, where can uh, listeners go to find the book? Uh, the book is available exclusively on Amazon.com and uh, self-published through my, my own imprint, Hightower Press, uh, because it's the kind of book you can't get a conventional publisher to publish it and I wanted to write it exactly the way I wanted without censorship and uh, it's I'm, I'm happy to say since 2013 it's been selling steadily and people around the world are buying it all the time and there's a lot of interest in the subject and in the book so I'm very happy about that and I, I, I hope people enjoy it. Well we hope to have you on again very soon. Thank you for sharing that with us. After reading your works, they've had a deep effect on me, and it gave me a deeper understanding of these subjects, and I thank you for that. Thank you, Bob, for all your support and uh, empathetic reading, and Warren for your, your uh, support and involvement. It's really good talking to you guys. It's really meaningful to me. I appreciate it. I hope people uh, learn from it. I thank you very much, Joe, and you stay in and stay safe out there. You too. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay.